Welcome everyone. I'm Renee Murray. I'm with the Friends of Wakala Springs, a nonprofit citizen support organization supporting our beautiful Wakala Springs, the Spring Basin, and of course our wonderful park. The program you are about to see is supported by the Florida Humanities, the state affiliate of the National Endowment for the Humanities. Florida Humanities funds and coordinates public humanity programs and publications that explore the people, places, and ideas that shape our state. In addition to the Florida Talks program, Florida Humanities provides grant funding to cultural institutions, brings traveling Smithsonian exhibits to rural and underserved communities, and publishes Forum, their award-winning magazine. Private contributions are critical to sustaining the programs of the Florida Humanity. For more information on the organization and how to support Florida Humanities, please visit floridahumanities.org. All righty. David, please join me. Hi, David. Hi. Great to be here with you today. Oh man, it's great to be here with you. You know, let me let me get a little intro for you, and and then I'm gonna gonna give you give you the whole um, um, virtual platform and podium. All right. So David Head is an associate lecturer of history at the University of Central Florida, one of our colleagues' universities, and a distinguished faculty fellow in history at Kentucky Wesleyan's College. He has published four books, including A Crisis of Peace, George Washington. The Newburgh Conspiracy and the Fate of the American Revolution, which was a finalist for the prestigious George Washington Prize. Um, a Republic of Scoundrels, which sounds really interesting. The Schemes, Intriguers, and Adventures who created a new American nation, which will be later published this year. And today's talk is drawn from his first book, Pirateers of Americas, Spanish American Pirateering from the United States in the Early Republic, which is honored for its research by the Mystic Seaport Museum in Connecticut. Tonight, David will be discussing pirates, pirateers, I just like to say that, pirateers, <laughs> and the fall of Spain's empire, how Spanish American independence brought Florida to the United States. Welcome. And I um, am going to hand this over to you, sir, okay? Well, thank you very much for that introduction. And thank you everyone for joining me here tonight. Uh, I'm delighted to be here to talk to you about uh, a slice of Florida's history from early in the 19th century and part of the story of how Florida became into uh, the United States. Right, so a little bit of an overview of uh, what my presentation will cover tonight. Uh, first, I'm gonna begin with some background so that we're all on the same page to give context for the main event, the main story I'm gonna tell about pirates and privateers. I'll talk a little bit about the Spanish-American Wars of Independence and how they affected Florida. Then I'll be talking about uh, the difference between privateers and pirates. They have uh, some things in common, such as they captured, uh, captured vessels and for, for the profit uh, that they could take from them. They sometimes employed uh, some of the same people, would move from one area to the other, but there are also significant differences between the two practices. Finally, I'll talk about uh, a little bit about the site of the um, uh, activity that I'll be uh, covering today, which is East Florida. Uh, what exactly East Florida was in the 19th century. Now, if there's an East Florida, you may know that there was also a West Florida. So I'll talk a bit about what the Floridas were in the late 18th and early 19th century before they became part of the United States. The main story that I'll tell today has to do with the invasions of Amelia Island, this place here uh, off the Atlantic coast of Florida near Jacksonville. In Jacksonville, of course, is expanding uh, outward like many places in Florida growing very quickly. Uh, so it's not kind of out reaching out in this area here. Maybe that's a bit of an exaggeration, but uh, this is off the coast of uh, uh, Northeast Florida here, that's Amelia Island. And that was the target of two invasions led by uh, forces on behalf of uh, the Spanish-American Wars of Independence. One was led by a man named Gregor McGregor, and the other was led by a man named Louis Michel Ory. And you can tell by their names that they, of course, go their families go way back in uh, Spanish history. They were part of Columbus's voyage. No, of course not. 
Uh, one is um, Scottish and the other is French. And I'll explain how in the world they got uh, connected to Spanish-American uh, wars of independence. Finally, I'll end the talk today by saying a little bit about the reasons for US intervention, um, how the United States came to intervene in um, the situation at Amelia Island. This was uh, the, really the first foreign policy crisis faced by President James Monroe as he came into office in 1817. So that's the plan for the lecture tonight. And again, I'm delighted to have you here to listen um, to the story of Florida's early history. A little bit of background uh, to our story to begin with. The Spanish-American Wars of Independence, that um, is the, the background that drives forward a lot of the larger context of the, of the action I'm talking about today. So the Spanish-American Wars of Independence were closely connected to the Napoleonic Wars. And so Napoleon fighting uh, against, principally against Britain and its allies, trying to conquer Europe. As part of Napoleon's quest to conquer Europe, he invades Spain in 1808. As he invades Spain, he deposes the king, King Ferdinand, uh, forces him into exile, and he replaces the Spanish king with a king of his own, a man that he knows will be loyal to him and not to the Spanish people. Uh, that man is one of Napoleon's brothers. This is something, a strategy that Napoleon follows um, throughout his conquest of Europe to make sure that he can trust whoever it is that he puts in charge, be loyal to him and not anyone else. He puts various family members on the thrones of the places that he captures. Now, I, when I read about this um, as practice, I began to feel a bit jealous or a little bit uh, uh, resentful of the, the fact that I have two brothers and neither one of them has ever conquered anywhere to make me king. Okay? You'd think the least they could do is make me a prince or a duca somewhere, but they have not done so yet. So next time I talk to them, I'll have to, to, to get, get on them for that. Where's your plan moving forward? I would need to be a king of something. In response to Napoleon uh, putting his brother on the throne of Spain, the uh, Spanish people, of course, did not go for this, being ruled by, by a foreigner. They began to form these bodies called juntas. And these juntas were governing uh, organizations that were meant to sort of run things in the king's absence, to uh, put together the resistance to Napoleon's rule. And those juntas that were, again, governing in the king's name with the expectation that when the king returned, that he would return to power and the juntas would go away. Those bodies are formed both in Spain itself as well as in Spain's colonies. So both in Europe and in the Americas. Now, now some of those juntas began going a step beyond simply being caretakers or placeholders uh, to resist the French until King Ferdinand could come back. Some of those juntas began discussing independence. So obviously they want to resist France, but also they start planning independence from Spain. So both against the French and the Spanish. And some of those juntas begin declaring independence in 1811 and others of them follow. This is a, a painting from later in the 19th century uh, showing uh, the, the declaration of in, declaring independence in, um, in Venezuela. Also by coincidence on July 4th, Okay. July 4th, apparently being the uh, day that you declare independence of a European monarchy. Okay. Um, it, was, it was coincidence. They weren't you know, self-consciously following the American example. But it's a neat coincidence when that happens. Now, some of these juntas are seeking independence, but others stay loyal to Spain. And so the fight for independence is both against Spain and against other Spanish-American juntas. So the Spanish-American Wars of Independence, uh, they combine a civil war, right, the, the war for, for, the, for the control of the same government. It is a kind of colonial war of rebellion against the uh, colonial power. And it's also a foreign war against the French. So you have multiple sides all mixed together. One aspect that's very common to 18th and 19th century warfare is to commission privateers. Uh, as a way to project your naval power, um, to supplement your naval power. Now, this is something that was turned to by the uh, independent-seeking juntas because they did not have much of a maritime tradition of their own. 
much of their trade was carried by British ships or ships from Spain. Uh, comparatively little in terms of shipbuilding and everything else that goes along with it and the, the sailors and the captains and the navigation and the financing and all those kind of things that did not have very much of that um, natively in Spanish America. So turning to privateers, when Spanish American countries recruited privateers, what exactly were they doing? A, um, a privateer is a privately owned warship, meaning that it's not a naval vessel, which is a warship that is owned by the government. And so a warship, today, war, today warships are owned by navies, are, are naval and they're owned by governments. But in the 19th century, you could have both publicly owned naval warships and privately owned privateering warships. Privateers were usually, during peacetime, they were usually merchant vessels that during times of war then were converted over to uh, a, a warlike purpose as the language of the time often was, was used. Um, this is a good way to continue using your vessels, put them to a productive use. When um, you know, merchant trade is disrupted by war, you can use the same vessel to make a profit for, your, for, your, for yourself as a ship owner by converting them over to privateers. Uh, the critical thing that a privateer has that makes them privateers and not pirates is that they receive a commission, a, a legal document that empowers the privateers to capture enemies on behalf of the country that commissions them. Okay, so they're sharing in their ability to make war with um, the privateers. You see, this is a privateering commission. At one point in the past, usually in the earlier 1800s, they're called a letter of mark. But the 19th century, they're uh, called somewhat less glamorously, simply a commission. And the commission is part uh, form letter and part uh, you know, where you fill in the details of your, of your ship. These are kind of fun to find in the archives. I don't, you don't find them in every case, but when they do find them, they're kind of fun because they're large. I mean, they're like, they're like this. They're large documents. You have to fold them up. Um, fold, un, unfold them very carefully because usually they've been folded for a long time, sometimes hundreds, hundred years or, or more. And um, they have a seal down here. This is a wax seal that, um, you know, it's like the copy didn't come out fully, but that's a wax seal down there. And you see there's places where you fill in uh, the name of the captain, the name of the vessel, okay, how many men it has, how many arms it has, how many cannon, all that kind of thing. Okay. This one has, looks like 21 or 24 hombres as, as its crew. Okay. Uh, then it has details of the date and time and all that and the authority that is signing it. And so that is what a commission looks like. Privateers are motivated in part by a desire to help their country, so patriotic motivation. But what makes privateering really work as something that you undertake is the hope of making money off of this, the, this uh, enterprise. So privateers get to keep, or keep the, the vessels and goods that they capture. Captured vessels and, and uh, goods are called prizes, okay? like you're winning the lottery or something, but they're called prizes. And um, after undergoing a court proceeding, if all the rules have been followed and it's a legitimate target that's been captured according to the rules, then the um, captors, the privateer, will get to keep the prize. And then they can they sell that and they, they divide up the, the money after that. A critical thing to understand about privateers is that privateers exist only during times of war. So there's really no such thing as a peacetime privateer. And privateers are limited to attacking enemies. They can't just go around uh, attacking indiscriminately anybody. Because if they do go around attacking anyone indiscriminately, that is good evidence that they are, bullet point number two there, a pirate. Pirates act with no legal authority whatsoever. They have no commission. Um, they're doing their captures on their own authority, which is also known as stealing. When you take something that doesn't belong to you on your own authority, right, that is stealing. Pirates attack anyone at any time. Ships from their own nation, ships from an enemy nation, neutral vessels, I don't know, the vessels of other pirates, if they could, if they could do it. Okay, so anybody is a potential target for a pirate. One of the things that um, courts will often do to kind of separate out a badly behaving privateer from a true pirate is whether the privateer has stuck to its uh, attacking enemy vessels. If a privateer sticks to attacking only enemy vessels, 
it may not get to keep its prizes. They may, might not be declared a good prize, okay? but they don't get arrested and executed as pirates either. Is there, so there is some in between there. You can be a bad privateer, but still not be a pirate. If you're attacking everybody indiscriminately, then that's a sign you're a pirate. One more, one more slide of background here. So to understand Florida, uh, what is Florida? Uh, Florida in the, in the 18th and 19th century is actually two, there are two Floridas. Okay? Two Floridas for twice the Florida goodness. Um, we have East Florida and West Florida. So um, most of this today's state is East Florida, this yellow here. And I believe where you are, um, you are on the edge of East Florida. Okay? So you're, 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 I believe you're, you're east of the uh, Apalachicola River. That is the boundary between East Florida and West Florida. East Florida has its capital in um, St. Augustine. So over here, roughly over here. Um, really St. Augustine, I'm here. Uh, St. Augustine is the capital. Capital of West Florida is Pensacola. Okay, Pensacola is this one over here, I think. Um, so that's where the capital there is. Now, the critical thing about West Florida that's not shown on this map is that it actually extends westward to the Mississippi River. So those bottom parts of Alabama today, Mississippi today, and part of Louisiana, uh, the part of Louisiana is between the border of Mississippi and the Mississippi River, that's all West Florida also. <laughs> Excuse me. So West Florida extends to the Mississippi River. So the pan today's Panhill of Florida plus more. Um, and the border between the two is the Apalachicola, uh, Apalachicola River over here. Uh, Florida at the time is sparsely populated, but was by as a sparse European population. It was let's, let's say it that way. So a sparse European population. Of course, there's a larger uh, native population. It is loyal to Spain. So uh, as other places such as Mexico or Venezuela, uh, Argentina are declaring their independence from Spain, the colonies of East and West Florida stay loyal to Spain as Cuba stays loyal to, to Spain, as Puerto Rico stays loyal to Spain. Um, the reason that Spain cares about Florida has to do with its strategic importance to protecting Spanish trade. The way that the winds and currents go, you cannot sail from the Caribbean directly back to Spain. The usual pattern is to stop in Havana, Havana's up here, and then, then sail up the uh, channel here between the Bahamas on the over here on the east and Florida over here on the west. Um, if you know this area, this is called the Treasure Coast of Florida, the Treasure Coast of Florida, because there are shipwrecks there with treasure. Because you know, if you go the wrong move here, a storm pushes you the wrong way, it's easy to wreck your ship along here. Now, if you were an enemy, right, say France or Spain or France or England or even a pirate, if you wanted to capture Spanish ships, you would just sit here at the top. Having uh, St. Augustine provides some uh, some protection for trade coming to this region. We have a base of operations to keep this clear. That's why it is strategically important. It protects the shipping bound from Havana back to Spain. Okay, now to our, our main story. Now that we know Spanish-American Wars of Independence, pirates and privateers, and what East Florida is in the 19th century, that can bring all these things together in the evasions of East Florida. The first Spanish-American invasion of East Florida is led by this man here, uh, Gregor McGregor. Actually, I should back up and uh, uh, call him Sir McGregor, because that's what he always insisted on being called. I beg your pardon, Sir McGregor. Uh, the odd thing about his claim to be a Sir, however, is that the source of his nobility changed over time, and depending on who he was telling the story to. On some occasions, uh, Sir Gregor McGregor, uh, he claimed that he was the uh, the heir to a, a title of Scottish nobility. On other occasions, however, he claimed that he had been knighted by the King of Portugal for his service uh, as an ally to Portugal in the British Army. Now, if your source of nobility changes depending on the story, you can guess what the conclusion is. It probably means that you don't have any source of nobility at all. Um, McGregor, though, his, his background beyond his claims to nobility, his background is pretty certain is that he was a British officer, uh, so an officer in the British Army, 
and he served in the Peninsular Campaign of the Napoleonic Wars. So this is where Britain um, supports Spain and Portugal in their war against France. So he was serving um, on the Iberian Peninsula there. McGregor appears to have had a personality, a kind of quirk to his personality or a streak in his personality that made it difficult for him to get along with others, to take orders from others. Well, this is a really bad habit for a man in the military to have where taking orders is an essential part of the job. The story is that he had a falling out with his fellow officers one night. They were gambling over cards and there's a disagreement, probably cries of you cheated. And you know, if you, if you call me what, I demand satisfaction and all that kind of thing that eventually led to McGregor resigning his commission in the British army and, leading, and leaving the British service. Now, luckily for McGregor, at just the same moment that he is leaving the British service in 1811 is when Venezuela is declaring its independence. Venezuela and all the Spanish-American uh, would-be republics, they are looking for European-trained officers to lead their army. They don't have the same military experience, again, in South America that the that European officers would have. So they want European officers. Um, so McGregor travels to Venezuela gets a commission as a general, right? they, if they want European officers, they got to give a, a big title, which is certainly a more lofty title than McGregor could have ever enjoyed uh, at home in the British service. He marries the cousin of uh, Simone Bolivar, uh, Josefa, right? Josefa McGregor. I, I love when the names combine the, the, the Spanish and the, and the Scottish there in, in one name, it's really, the, the, I, I really like the, I like the sound of that. Um, so that helps him politically with his connection to the, the, the Bolivar family. As a uh, Venezuelan general, he uh, served in several campaigns, again, again um, alongside of uh, Simon Bolivar, but he also has trouble getting along with others uh, in the Venezuelan service. He decides that he is gonna go in his own direction, sponsor his own, uh, his own campaign, and that's what he decides to do with Amelia Island, is to lead a freelance expedition against the Spanish uh, colony um, in Florida. The plan, McGregor's plan in the spring of 1817. The plan is to recruit men and gather supplies in the United States. The United States is officially neutral in Spain's wars against its colonies. The United States is, has, uh, tries to maintain neutrality, but the cause of Spanish American independence is popular in the United States. Word is often seen by people as a, another example of the American Revolution. Okay, so a fight for independence from a European power, well, Americans can easily see themselves in that war. So the Spanish American cause of independence is popular in the United States. McGregor travels across the Eastern seaboard and recruits men, especially in Philadelphia, which is a real hotbed of Spanish American activity. This part of McGregor's plan is illegal. Uh, it's a violation of US neutrality to recruit American citizens to serve in a war against a country at peace with the United States. So no, you cannot show up and recruit men to fight against Spain. Um, that's against uh, US law. McGregor obtains a commission from South American agents in Philadelphia, which he th says make things, things legal, right? He has the legal authority to do it. This does not make things legal. Um, in fact, it is also against the law to accept a commission from a foreign government to make war against a power that is at peace with the United States. I've seen the, the document where uh, the commission, right, and it says on there, signed and delivered on this date in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, right? Um, McGregor presents this as evidence that what he's doing is, is legitimate. All that piece of paper is, is a signed admission of a felony right, that he's violated U.S. neutrality law. All right, so, but he has to go through all these steps. The next step is to conquer Amelia Island. Once Amelia Island is conquered, he plans to establish a base of operations to sponsor privateering. Privateers will bring in uh, uh, smuggled goods. Then he can sell those, those goods uh, over in Georgia, right across the border from Amelia Island, with the money that's raised from selling those smuggled goods brought in by privateers. That will allow him to resupply and replenish his... Uh, his supplies and recruit more men. And then his goal is to push on to the mainland of Florida so that he can conquer um, uh, St. Augustine and all of East Florida. 
They'll open up another front in the Spanish-American Wars of Independence so that um, now Spain has to fight to defend another part of its empire, so putting more pressure on Spain. Several years ago, I, um, I visited the site where the Spanish had their fort on Amelia Island. And I was excited to go check it out, see what's see what's there. You know, I've read about this place uh, for a long time, but now I'm going to go see see it. And we get there, and of course, it is simply an empty field. There's nothing left of the Spanish fort that was on that site. And this is the view of the river. This is the view looking back the other way. It's, I mean, the blue sky and the green grass looks pretty nice. Um, you know, I went there, took a couple pictures. Uh, it was in July, so it was hot. I got back in the car into the AC and drove away. That was my visit to this place where I read about for a long time, right? So sometimes historic sites are great and fun. Sometimes it's an open field because there's nothing there left. Amelia, uh, McGregor's invasion of Amelia Island goes swimmingly. Uh, he conquers Amelia Island on June 29th, 1817. Really, there's no real battle to this or you know, climactic, anything climactic or dramatic to it. He shows up with 100 men and about a dozen Spanish defenders okay, in that fort that is now on that empty field. Uh, they were scared away. So you know, 100 versus 12, these guys are not going to you know, die holding out over this patch of grass. They run away to St. Augustine. Um, McGregor then proclaims the island and the area he has conquered as La República de las Floridas. Please excuse my the, my Spanish pronunciation. That was I thought that was a good try, uh, close enough for for today. Uh, so he proclaims the Republic of the Floridas. This is the flag of the Florida Republic. Can you guess who designed this lovely green cross on a white background? It was, of course, McGregor himself. Uh, he is not only a general, revolutionary. He is also a flag designer. So that's what he designs. He also, uh, to commemorate his great victory over the Spanish, he has a commemorative medal struck. This is what the commemorative medal looks like. Uh, on the one side, it says Amalia, Vini Vidi Viki, or Wini Vidi Viki, depending on you, which, uh, which style of Latin you pronounce. Uh, on the one side, and on the other side, Libertas Floridarium Duque Mac Gregorio. Vini Vidi Viki, that of course is a slogan from. Think of it, if you remember, that's Julius Caesar in his uh, conquest of Gaul, right? I came, I saw, I conquered. You see the comparison that McGregor is trying to draw. Right? One of the great conquerors, great generals in all of Western uh, European history, Julius Caesar. And right, right next side to him is Sir General McGregor, right? two peas in a pod. That is McGregor and Caesar. Um, now, as the months go forward in the summer of 1817, McGregor has very little uh, success that follows his initial invasion. There's very little privateering. He only issues about a dozen commissions um, in, during his time in, in Florida. Because there's so little privateering, there is little smuggling to be done. If you don't have any goods coming in, you can't smuggle any goods into the United States. He also encounters resupply problems. So before leaving and leaving the United States for his invasion, McGregor had organized a uh, resupply ship to come from New York City, bringing more men and more and more guns and ammunition and food and all that kind of thing. Well, um, the customs collector at the Port of New York, he was on his game the day that the ship uh, applied for permission to leave port. The, the, the part of the process is the captain will show up with a manifest of his goods and the crew and all that, and the purpose of his voyage, Customs collector takes a look at it in the distance as you're going on a merchant vessel, merchant voyage to the Caribbean with all these guns and five times as many men as you need for a typical voyage. Can you explain this? And I just imagine the captain can just say, uh, I get lonely at sea, so I like to take my friends and we bond by shooting our guns off. Well, the, the customs collector makes them take off the, 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 man, the, the men until they're down to a crew that is a regular size for a merchant, merchant voyage. So they show up with much less than supplies and manpower than McGregor is counting on. At the same time, McGregor learns that the Spanish have regrouped in St. Augustine and that they're coming to counterattack, to retake Amelia Island. 
without the, the manpower he feels is sufficient, he gives up on his uh, project of liberating uh, Spanish, uh, Spanish Florida for the Spanish American cause of independence, and he sails away. The next time McGregor shows up in the historical record, he shows up pursuing a real estate fraud in Central America. Uh, one of these things where he has a tract of land and he's selling 500% of it to investors in Europe who don't know any better because they're so far away. Um, perhaps this is cynical, but I, I wonder, you know, he could have stayed in Florida if he wanted to do land fraud. That's, uh, that's part of the Florida tradition, is it not? Uh, so that is McGregor and his story. Now, the uh, Spanish-American um, presence at Amelia Island gets new life very quickly. Following McGregor's uh, departure, some, he had left some men behind. There are some men who wanted to stay behind, who didn't want to go with McGregor, who wanted to keep fighting uh, for Florida to push on to the mainland. They thought his plan was still viable. Those men are in place in Amelia Island when the Spanish counterattack comes, and the remnant of McGregor's force is actually large enough to defeat the Spanish counterattack. Those, uh, the remnant then, uh, their leaders, start to form kind of a government there. But two days later, their rule is usurped when this man here, Louis Michel Ori, arrives off the coast of Amelia Island. Louis Michel Ori uh, had originally come to the Caribbean from France in the French Navy. Then he had left the French Navy and become a French privateer. He sailed in the Caribbean and the Gulf of Mexico, uh, operating in part out of New Orleans, which had a large uh, French uh, population. Uh, capturing uh, English vessels, uh, uh, selling their goods in New Orleans, also uh, selling enslaved people uh, in New Orleans, smuggling them into Louisiana. He left the Spanish, uh, the French service and joined the Spanish American service. Um, and he became a naval officer in the Cartagenian Naval Navy. Cartagena uh, being then a, a, is one of those juntas representing the city state of Cartagena part of Colombia today. Um, the, um, the Junta of Cartagena, this is one of those places where some of the Juntas were pro-independence and others of those in Colombia were not in favor of independence. Okay, so that's why it's just one city has its own Navy. Uh, Cartagena fell, fell to the Spanish at the end of 1815. Louis-Michel Ori was part of the, uh, the, the naval force that uh, helped some people evacuate from uh, Cartagena. They regrouped in Haiti, but in Haiti, when they were grouping, Cartagena, um, uh, Ori decides that he does not want to follow the plans that were being laid by Simon Bolivar. He wanted to go in his own direction. He then links up with a group of private military adventurers called filibusters. In 19th century, filibustering is a private military adventure, not a tactic to delay legislature in the Congress. Um, and so a private military adventure, adventure that was planning to attack Spanish Mexico with the goal of liberating Mexico from Spanish rule. Uh, the um, filibuster is successful in part. It gets a toehold in uh, Mexican Texas, Spanish Texas, um, and uh, um, or he establishes himself on the island of Galveston as the governor of Galveston, Texas, given a commission by the revolutionary authorities of Mexico. So this is Galveston that's um, off the coast of uh, Houston today. He engages in privateering, smuggling, and slave trading, but eventually Ori is pushed out of Galveston by two men you may have heard of previously, Jean and Pierre Lafitte. You probably, if you've heard of them, you've heard of them in connection to the Battle of New Orleans, where the Americans defeated the British uh, as part of the War of 1812 in part with the help of, well, anybody who was in prison was let out of prison to fight on the American side against the British. And that included uh, Pierre Lafitte. For their service in that, uh, in that battle, the Lafittes and some of their other uh, pirate um, assistant associates there had earned a pardon. But then the Lafittes uh, follow up their American service by becoming spies on behalf of Spain. And one of the, the places they are commissioned to spy on is Galveston because Ori is sponsoring Spanish-American attacks on Spanish ships. Uh, the Lafitte's go there, they, uh, they observe Ori's operations, they decide that they're going to take it over for themselves, they push Ori out of the way. All at the same time claiming to Spain 
that they have a plan to roll up all of the uh, uh, filibusters and privateers there. They just need a little bit more time to put it into effect. And they, of course, have to keep up appearances by uh, trading in goods that come through there, because otherwise, you know, they'll know the Spanish are onto them. They keep up that game for a while. Or he sails out of Galveston, okay, around through the Gulf of Mexico, and up to Amelia Island, where he heard uh, McGregor has a has a operation there, and he arrives a couple days after uh, McGregor's out of the way, and this other force has just defeated the Spanish. He shows up and takes charge, and he claims that that he is now chief uh, that he is now in charge of Amelia Island as a chief of the Mexican Republic, the chief of Mexican Florida. That's probably not something you expected to hear today, Mexican Florida, but that's what Ori claimed to be the leader of. This is the only um, image that I've ever been able to find of Ori that traced to the 19th century. And it is said to be a self-portrait. I cannot very, uh, verify any of the, any detail uh, connected with that story. I don't know if this is Ori for sure, and I certainly don't know if he's the one who drew this, but it's the closest thing I have to any picture of Ori. So I'll, I'll share that there provisionally. Once installed as a chief of the of uh, Mexican Florida, uh, Ori begins enjoying success where McGregor had failed. He was much more successful in sponsoring privateering. And according to one estimate of a US newspaper, in the fall of 1817, Ori saw some $500,000 in prize goods passed through Amelia Island. If you multiply it by 10, you get a rough equivalent today, although it's you know, a rough uh, um, translating value over time is very difficult because you have you, know, you have goods that don't exist in the 19th century at any at any price. So how do you translate that? But it'll give you a rough estimate if you multiply by 10. This is another example of a privateering commission. You can see this one. I got this one in color. You can see the the wax seal down there. Okay, so again, another uh, impressive looking document. Uh, you can see right where I had to unfold it very carefully. And parts of it are missing because it's been felt folded in there and you know, so long. Um, Ori is a prolific slave trader. By my count, I counted it uh, between 600 and 950 people were moved from Amelia Island in the fall of 1817. The reason for that uh, broad disparity there is that the sources are not very good at being specific in how many people come in. This is something that I found very disappointing because, you know, I, having a, a, some sense of the, of the scale is very important to me as I was doing research. And people sometimes they just don't care. I mean, for them, people are just a, another kind of commodity that you can estimate and take a, break, take a guess at. Uh, it's not so important for them to be precise. Okay. McGregor, uh, um, Worry, like McGregor, tried to establish an official government. He tried to draft a constitution, model on the US Constitution and the Federalist Papers. Okay. One thing that really allowed uh, Ori to succeed where McGregor had failed was that Ori was very sharp in exploiting loopholes in U.S. law. So one loophole in U.S. law had to do with the jurisdiction of the Customs Service. Customs Service was, um, by law, they're not allowed to uh, stop vessels that were, that were smaller than 10 tons. The thinking being it was not a good use of customs uh, revenue, uh, uh, resources, to stop vessels that were so small, right? How much in value are you really going to get on such a small vessel? Well, Ori found a way because Amelia Island is so close to Georgia, right across the border, you can row back and forth, back and forth. You can do it repetitively over time. And even when the customs collector saw what was going on, he did not have the authority to, to make a stop because the vessels were too small. Also, sometimes the enslaved people are assigned to do the rowing. So if the person who is valuable and going to be sold is also the source of the transportation, well, you can see how that would make the trade more efficient and more profitable for Ori. Another consideration that Ori takes advantage of is the fact that the United States is neutral in the, uh, in the wars. They don't want to get involved. They don't want to use US force against one side, but not the other. A naval commander writes to his authorities, the Secretary of the Navy in Washington, and says, I see what's going on. But I considered it neutral ground where this is happening, and it was the wish of the government not to infringe. So he stands by and lets it happen. Now to the question of U.S. intervention. So what's the United States going to do about all of this? Well, the problem, of course, is that Amelia Island and Spanish East Florida more generally lies outside of U.S. jurisdiction. 
This is territory claimed by both Spain and Spanish America. And if the United States intervenes, they're going to make somebody or perhaps both sides angry. It's especially tricky because at the time, the United States is, has been and for a while and is reaching, reaching a critical, critical point in their negotiations uh, with Spain for a treaty that will allow the United States to acquire Florida, settle the boundary between the United States and Spain in the West, they settle kind of an, on a number of issues between the two countries, especially acquire the Floridas for the United States. So the United States does not necessarily want to intervene if that's going to upset Spain and make them walk away from the, from the bargaining table. At the same time, intervention might offend Spanish Americans. And as I said previously, the cause of Spanish American independence is popular. And the idea that the United States would take sides when they're supposed to be neutral could cause prob problems for the president domestically. Monroe, President Monroe eventually chooses intervention, however. He does so based on the advice of this man over here, John Quincy Adams, who at one point says, we need to break up the marauders. Um, Adams reached that conclusion based on four points of reasoning. Number one, he pointed to all the violations of US law that were being carried out through Amelia Island. This, the, the, the looking the other way at pirates who brought goods in. Um, the the uh, viol violations of U.S. neutrality, violations of U.S. Uh, revenue law for smuggling, violations of the slave trade laws. It also turned out that Amelia Island was the fourth privateering center for Spanish American activity in, um, in recent years. So there's Amelia Island before there was Galveston that I mentioned. There's also New Orleans and Lafitte's, which I hinted at. And then another area that I did not mention was Baltimore, Maryland, where there's also popular Spanish American privateering. So it looks like this problem is getting worse and worse and worse. Um, Quincy, uh, John, John Quincy Adams convinced Monroe that he need not pay any respect to the Amelia Island governments that claim to be legitimate. First, I mean, how Ori can, can be a chief of Mexico in Florida, that doesn't make any sense. And then the way that McGregor received the, the commission illegally in the United States, well, that means the whole thing's illegal. So no need to respect those governments. Finally, there happened to be a convenient law on the books uh, for, that was applied to this situation, the so-called no transfer resolution. This was a law that had been enacted in 1811. And it said that the president was empowered to use military force if it, uh, to, to secure Florida, if it looked like Spain was going to lose Florida to some other country. So the United States wanted to make sure that Spain held Florida so that Spain would have Florida to trade to the United States in their treaty negotiations. Because if, say, Britain seizes Florida, then Spain doesn't have it to give to the United States, and Britain is certainly not going to deal with the United States to give up Florida. So the idea being, if it looked like Britain, for example, was going to grab Florida, then the United States should go grab it first. This law was actually secret. It was secret and when it was passed uh, because it didn't want to provoke a crisis by passing a law that seemed aggressive against um, Britain or other countries. And it was revealed for the first time in 1817. Several years ago, I gave a presentation like this. And during the Q&A, someone asked, do we still have secret laws today? And of course, I said, no, wait a minute. this is America. We don't have secret laws. And then two seconds later, I realized, if it's a secret, how would I know? And how would any of us know? I don't have any secrecy, top secret. I don't have any security clearance. So I don't know. Maybe someday we'll find out that there's a secret law. Although it would be suspicious, it was applied as conveniently as it was in this case. So General Monroe, uh, General Monroe President Monroe uh, orders the military to Amelia Island. And this event, like McGregor's initial invasion, is kind of an anti-climax. The Army and the Navy land on Amelia Island. They show up in force, or he sees the handwriting on the wall, and he leaves voluntarily. So there's no battle or anything. The United States does not give Amelia Island back to Spain. They keep it under U.S. jurisdiction so that when uh, the United States acquires Florida from Spain, it was finalized in 1821, um, Amelia Island has already been controlled by, by the United States for several years. So Amelia Island gets into the country a little bit earlier than the rest of Florida does. Um, that brings me to the end of my talk today. I want to thank you again for uh, coming here tonight to listen to me. Here are some of my, uh, some of my uh, contact information. So that uh, if you think of anything after our question answered uh, period today, um, you can get in touch with me any of these ways. 
if you are dozing off to sleep tonight and you bolt up right thinking that's what I've always wanted to ask about James Monroe's foreign policy, you can roll over and go back to sleep because I will be able to, to uh, help you out in the morning if you contact me in one of these ways. I look forward to uh, hearing your questions and thank you again for coming tonight. David, that was wonderful. And we have a handful of questions that we're going to have to try and get through, okay? Okay, so, I'll be as quick as I can. There you go. Let's see. So um, one, the first question was, um, who is the most notable of notorious pirates that would be associated during this time frame? So in the 19th century, the most notorious pirates that we have heard that we've heard of are mostly dead and gone. Guys like Blackbeard and all those kind of guys are mostly eliminated. The ones that I, I the, the ones that are most remembered today are, are really the Lafitte's. Um, and Jean Pierre Lafitte, they mostly traded with pirates. They were they were they they went to uh, Jean was a captain in some respects, but mostly they were the ones who traded with the pirates and and uh, move their goods into the United States. So the guys that they work with, those are probably the biggest names, the Lafitte's and their associates in um, the Barataria region of New Orleans, or okay. of Louisiana, I should say. Yeah. Okay, well, well, then, then it kind of goes into the next one here as well. Um, were there privateers, and you touched on this during the talk, who turned pirates and who's the most notorious? And I almost can guess what you're gonna answer, but go ahead. Right, so- Yeah. They are, this is one interesting thing. So, so privateering by the 19th century has been sorted out legally. So in legal theory, there's a good understanding of what privateering is and how it's distinct from piracy. Individual cases, however, get really complicated. And there are men who go from privateering into piracy. I mean, Ori is a privateer, but he can you know, capture ships illegally. You know, it depends. They sail, right, they sail pretty close to the law sometimes, right? So defining who is and who's not is can be difficult. The Lafitte's work with pirates and also with privateers. The Lafitte's are very good at using the paperwork of uh, the business of privateering and merchant trade to kind of cover their tracks and make it look like what they're doing is legal. So yes, there is some overlap between the two in practice. Um, theoretically though, it is kind of neat. And you know, honestly, it's, it's, the, it's the hard cases that get all the attention, right? But it's also hard, the saying is, right? Hard cases make bad law. There are plenty of cases that I see in the case files of boring procedures where the captures go according to plan, they transfer the goods from one party to the other, and that's it. There's no exotic piracy question in there anywhere. But those are not as much fun <laughs> as the piracy one. So the piracy one gets more attention even though privateering is in many ways kind of a normal business procedure in the early 19th century. So, so the long arm of the law when a privateer would go rogue and go pirate, um, what were the consequences for for that? Right, so it depends exactly what were they, they ever do. caught? They can be caught, yes. So um, right, you, you would catch them in port, right? So, so it depends what they want to do. So some of these guys, they want to go back to the seaport and you know live their life on land. They don't want to be perpetually on the run, right? So you're gonna go back to your seaport. Well, then you have an opportunity, there's an opportunity for someone you've wronged to identify you to authorities. Um, it what would happen to them? It depends what exactly they did. So if someone were murdered, for example, during the capture of a vessel, um, if you have a couple of cases where privateer crews are unhappy with their captains, they have a mutiny, they murder their captain, run away with the ship, and then start capturing vessels along the way during their cruise. And so these are privateers to start out, but then they commit mutiny and they start capturing vessels indiscriminately. So in a case like that, if they are apprehended, then they would be tried for piracy. Um, however, if you are a privateer and you sort of stick to your limits of your commission, you don't murder anybody, but you maybe take a vessel that is neutral, but you can invent a reason why it's an enemy, right? That's something where you probably would simply not get to keep the um, the vessel that you captured. You would probably go uh, walk away with your freedom. Even for those men who are accused of piracy in this in this on uh, this period in connection with Spanish American activities, they're rarely executed. So there's only a handful of execution. The others uh, often get a pardon. Right? The, the feel I guess the feeling is that they're kind of put up to it. Um, by 
captains who went too far. So hmm. kind of interesting that they're not, there aren't mass hangings. There are arrests and trials and convictions, but often most of the pirates are, uh, even convicted pirates are pardoned. Well, that's interesting. So, so one, one of our viewers wanted to know, during war, the privateers were what we would consider today as mercenaries. Mm -hmm. And is that, is that, is that, is that Similar, correct? yes. Well, then I would, I don't, well, I don't know the depth. I'm not, the definition of mercenaries is something I'm not entirely familiar with. They're not paid a salary. So they're, um, and they're not foreign to the, they're, well, they're often not, they're often part of the country that they represent. One piece of the puzzle, one piece of the story I did not touch on is that many of the men who accept, many of the Americans and uh, non-Spanish, non-Spanish Americans who accept Spanish American privateering commissions, they tried to expatriate themselves, give up their American or other citizenship, become a citizen of the country that they are sailing for. Um, so in that sense, they are acting as kind of an auxiliary military force. Um, so right. yeah, I'm not sure what, again, the definition of mercenary and how it's changed over time, that's a little, uh, um, that one I'm not From sure. From a historian's on, perspective, so. of course, yes, right. you're absolutely right. Mercenaries yeah. of today aren't mercenaries of yesteryear. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. But in some sense, in the sense of being private individuals sponsored by a government to carry out warfare on behalf of a government, that's where they, they overlap with some of the mercenaries or even um, some of the private contractors in wars today. Okay, okay. Here's a question. Um, um, let's see, let me get this right. Oh, were there any female privateers or pirates during this period? During this period, not that I've, come, not that I've encountered, no. There okay. are some famous stories of women pirates in the 1720s, but no, I did not, um, I did not encounter any, any women among the crew. No, I didn't. Well, well, this this viewer kind of guessed you might say that, so mm -hmm. they they followed up with another question, okay. which was, if there were not any, um, what would you say were there any influential females that that um, during this time period that affected the Amelia Island outcome and and that part of um, the world? Right. So, how are women involved in this? I do find so these guys do want to go back to sea, and many of the the captains I encountered, they have families, right? That they're supporting and they're they're leaving at home uh one sea captain i came across i think he has like nine or ten children i mean um another guy he basically sets up his family through his uh privateering ventures so that he then becomes one of the elite in baltimore and he sends his kids to the elite private school and he makes the jump from you know sea captain is not at the bottom they're kind of middle middle there but now he's kind of on the upper crust there um so that's one of the ways in which uh, women and families are involved. Um, and certainly they are um, there at home for this is part of the motivation of why some of these men are doing it. Also, another way that women are involved, they might not guess at first, is they're they're you know they're gonna be the ones buying a lot of the goods, right? These are sometimes they, they think all kinds, whatever's not, you know, whatever's on the ship, uh, they'll try and smuggle. Of course, they want gold and silver, but goods are good are just fine too. And of course, the women are as the consumers, kind of um, unheralded, but buying the goods as recipient of a lot of those goods. That's where the the women come into the story, also. Okay, well, that's that's a fair, fair, good, good answer, I think. Here's a question that that kind of brings us up to modern times. Um, if you were to have a direct message to our current governor and legislators for forward research, education, and conservation of historical heritage, um, where um, should this story be presented for Amelia Island, and and um, what should that message be for 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 us today? Right, I think um, I think that recovering Florida's early history is really critical. One of you know, as part of Florida's the way Florida has developed over time. Right, we have a Florida's a long history goes back four hundred years, but the bulk of our population growth has been in the last fifty. Right. Mm -hmm. So and that right. tends to get a lot of the, the attention. I sometimes joke with people that Orlando was founded in 19, in 1971 uh, when Disney World opens. Right. There's, there's nothing before that in Orlando. Um, you know, and it's this huge growth since, since, since then. Um, so that's what I would really try to connect today and the people who live here today with Florida's early story, uh, especially its, its Spanish period and the ways in which the Spanish period um, in a, in a, overlaps with a British period and an American period 
And of course, there are uh, various native groups here. Um, slavery is practiced in, uh, in Florida. So there's um, African-American population. Florida was also a place where uh, enslaved people in the British colonies could run away to and gain uh, their freedom in Florida. So Florida as a place that has a very complicated history that reaches back 400 years, various different pe peoples um, and overlapping and all influencing each other in this historical development. I think that's really a critical story to tell. Um, in addition, of course, to the modern history that people tend to really um, connect with because it's closer in time, but you know, it, 400 years. I mean, one of the frustrations I have in doing colonial in our 18th century American Revolution history is that it's so dominated by Massachusetts, right? Uh, Massachusetts, yeah. Virginia. That, that's, the piece, that's the story people know about the colonial and revolutionary America. Well, Florida's here too at the same time, right? <laughs> so I think, especially as we get to the 200, 250th anniversary of the American Revolution, emphasizing Florida's role in the American Revolution and that essential part of American history would be really important too. I, I like that. That's great. That's great. Here's a question about maritime law. Um, what okay. historical aspects of maritime law embedded in the pirates and pirateering are still used and enforced currently? Okay. Do you have any well, idea on that one? Well, Ooh. if I'm going to give uh, if I'm going to give legal advice, I'll have to turn on my my <laughs> hourly rate there. Of, uh, <laughs> and say, yeah, it's a maritime lawyer. I, honestly, I don't I don't know the the, the maritime law today and how much um, how much influence there is. I'm, I'm sure that some of the case law goes back that far. Uh, privateering is not practiced anymore, uh, so that so I still all my all my reading in uh, 19th century uh, legal sources is for something that's now defunct. Um, you do see yeah. occasionally calls for people. People do occasionally make calls to kind of revive privateering as a way to address things like uh, I remember there's a, I wrote about this last spring. Someone uh, a congressman had an idea to bring back privateering to how to punish Russian oligarchs and seize their yachts or something like that. And, you know, I wrote a piece saying, well, you know, the really, the point, what made privateering work is the fact that the captors, not just they had a commission, they're doing this on behalf of a government, it's that they got to keep what they captured. So you're gonna have to make it possible, they're not just gonna go destroy some guy's yacht, they're gonna to wanna to capture the thing and sell it. Right? And yeah. how, how, how's that gonna work? You gotta sail away with that. So, you know, people sometimes they, they pull out part of the historical practice that seems relevant, but you got to pull the whole thing together because it's not just one piece of it that we can bring. It's also the other piece that that's what made privateering work was the financial benefits that, that the uh, privateers got out of it, not just that they were private individuals who could act when a government didn't. And so in that sense, it it's, can be seen as relevant today, but you got to bring the whole analogy, not just part of it, I think. Yeah, you know, I, I think we have time for, for one more question and, and um, I hope you, you can answer this one here. Um, someone would like to know more about your upcoming book. Okay, well, that's great. So- Yeah, uh, how's that is, for yeah, unexpected? Excellent, an excellent, uh, excellent segment. Yeah. I leave you, <laughs> hopefully I leave the audience wanting more. Um, there you so go. This is, this, is a, this is a book of, of essays that, um, that I and a colleague edited. So these are our essays written by others. So, so not by me, but that I was editor and organizer along with my colleague. And it's about scoundrels in early America. So by scoundrels, we mean uh, traitors uh, like Benedict Arnold and Aaron Burr, um, mm -hmm. uh, land speculators like William Blount of uh, Tennessee, uh, kind of all purpose spies and intriguers like James Wilkinson, who had, a, who had a, kind of like a hand in, who's a Spanish, who's a, a general in the United States Army and a spy for Spain at the same time, Wilkinson was. Um, busy guy. Florida, yeah, busy guy, yeah. Um, the Kemper Rebellion in West Florida. Uh, mm -hmm. Reuben Kemper and his associates. Some, 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 some of you up there in the panhandle might know that story. Uh, so those guys as scoundrels. And it's, it's, it's really fun. It's a really fun story of guys who are up to no good in the early Republic and how their actions were influential in creating the country that the United States became. It'll be out in December. So um, put it on your Christmas wish list early. Well, let us know. We'll, we will, we will um, share that with, uh, with this audience here when, when it's out for, for purchase. And I love the title. And it <laughs> sounds to me like you, uh, 
you incorporated some of the Florida influence in there. Mm -hmm. So I, I love that for sure. Um, listen, folks, we, we have run out of time and I want to thank everyone for coming. And let me just let you know that, let me share this real fast here. There we go. That um, we have um, a survey that you're going to get an email on. And if you would please take the time to take the survey, I, we would appreciate it that very much. And David, thank you for this wonderful presentation, all the work and research that you do and all your teaching that you do. Um, please, please do continue with this amazing work. And um, thanks for joining us, everybody. And next month, we do have um, Elliot Kleinsberg on War in Paradise, World War II in Florida. So please join us for that. And if you have not already done so, um, be sure to um, tune in next Tuesday because we have Rivers Beneath Us. And it is going to be a wonderful program talking about Wakulla Springs underwater cave system. Once again, if you're not a member of the Friends, please do consider joining or provide a donation to the Friends of Wakulla Springs to support our efforts and outreach. Good night, everyone, and, and stay safe.